Good morning. We hope you all are doing well this morning. We thank you all for being here. Uh, it is very humbling to stand before you and try to teach to you this morning. I am not a preacher. Brad is a preacher. And I very much appreciate what he does for this congregation. Uh, I am sorry if you're here to hear Brad. You'll have to listen to me for about an hour and a half. I've only got about seven or eight pages of notes. So anyway, uh, Mitchell will be uh, speaking to you this, uh, this evening. Uh, I talked to him the other day and what he's going to speak on. I'm interested to hear what he has to say. I uh, appreciate the elders giving me this opportunity. I don't thank Brad for the opportunity because he voluntold me, but that's okay. But seriously, we do. We're glad that you are here. So today we're going to try and talk about relationships. Um, a relationship that, that Jesus had with a very specific person. Somebody that I feel like I'm like, unfortunately, more often than I need to be. But before we do that, I want to talk about something else. In 1973, there's a horse named Big Red. Big Red won the Triple Crown, something that had not been done in 25 years. Uh, I guess most people probably know that horse as Secretariat. Secretariat had a very interesting pedigree. Uh, it had a long list of horses, the, the mom and the dad horse uh, that had, uh, was very successful that were made for running. And there was a lot that went into that horse. That horse was essentially won on a coin toss. And after the coin toss, the brother of the owner said, congratulations, you got something that no one else wanted. So they had a choice of two horses. They wanted the horse that nobody else wanted. There's a movie that Disney put out in 2010 about this horse and fittingly so, we watched it last night as a family. But there's a, a thing that's said in that movie over and over again. Run your race. It said to the daughter, early on by the father. The dad says it to the horse when he's very young, the first time that he meets the horse. And before the last race, before Secretary ends up winning the Triple Crown, Penny, the owner, says to the jockey, let him run his race. So today I'm going to use that little example and talk about Peter and his relationship, his pedigree that he has, the things that he has. So Dylan read to you this morning about <clears throat> a little bit about Peter. Uh, just a, a few things I want to talk about Peter and, and just give an overview before we kind of dive in and, and, and do some studying. His given name was Simon. Simon's a very, very common name. It's found about seven times or seven different people named Simon in the New Testament. Simon's a very common name, something that, um, that, that you would see very often during that time. But he's Simon's son of Jonah, Simon bar Jonah, which just means that he's the son of John or son of, uh, son of Jonas, uh, or Jonah. It could be uh, translated either one of those ways. He, we do know that he was married. Uh, several of the, the uh, apostles, we don't know that, but we do know that, that he was married. And most of the time when he was referred to as Simon, um, it was in regards to his possessions or his earthly things. For instance, we knowing that, that Simon was married, it says that Simon's mother-in-law when Jesus went to heal her or maybe that was Simon's boat that they got into to go fishing speaking of Simon was a fisherman a very hard worker probably spending a lot of time in the evenings maybe even throughout the night and the early mornings trying to catch fish I imagine he was fairly successful he had a brother named Andrew he was close friends with John and James. I wouldn't say that they were business partners, but they probably worked together quite a bit. I can't imagine him getting just a whole lot of sleep being a fisherman. Because the time that he wasn't fishing, we see him where he's mending his nets, or he's washing his nets. He probably has to do something with the fish that he caught. I don't know if the market bought it from him immediately, or if he had to, he had to sit there and sell his fish on his own. I don't know. But it doesn't sound like he had just a whole lot of downtime. 
So his name, Peter, where did it come from? Well, as Dylan read from you in John 42, Jesus named him Peter. You shall also be called Cephas, which means Peter. Luke tells us also in 614, when he's listing the apostles, Simon, speaking of Jesus, whom he named Peter. So he gave him an alternate, uh, alternate name, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So something we need to think about, too, <clears throat> and think about Peter, and something that's very significant. Uh, in uh, John MacArthur's book, Twelve Ordinary Men, he makes this list, and he lists the apostles. In each of the gospel accounts, and every time that they're listed, Peter is always first. There's significance to that. He was their leader. No one talked to Peter the way that, that Jesus did. Let me phrase that. Jesus never said things to other people the way that he talked to Peter. Peter was the leader of the twelve. He is oft, oftentimes a central theme in most of the stories that we read about in the New Testament. It's he that speaks first and so, so many times. Now there's no doubt that Peter tasted leather. He stuck his foot in his mouth so oftentimes. But we shouldn't let that um, let that deter us from the person that he is. Some of you may be taking notes. I'm going to give you a term. It's a Hebrew term called chutzpah. Chutzpah. It's spelled C-H-U-T-Z-P-A-H. I'll spell that again. C-H-U-T-Z-P-A-H. Pronounce chutzpah, like the hood of a car. Chutzpah is a very forthcoming type of faith. Somebody that um, is very confident. Somebody that is not afraid to ask questions. Um, he can also, honestly be a little bit abrasive. But Job asked a question of God. He asked three questions. Why was I born? Why am I here? That's chutzpah. It takes a lot of confidence and courage to ask that question. Moses, when he was standing before the burning bush, did the same thing. Why did you choose me? Who am I to say who sent me? It's not being disrespectful. It is more like a relationship that a mother or a father has with a son or a daughter. Your father or your mother tells you to do something or, or says that this is what we're going to do and you respond with a question. Or you may say, I don't feel that that's the way that we should do it. Because you have confidence that you can have that conversation with your parents. Again, not being disrespectful. But as we all know, the parents have a reason, for the reason why they're going to do something. And they're going to make that known. I want you to remember that term and think through that term as we study more about Peter, chutzpah. So Peter shows some of these same characteristics. Matthew 18, verse 21, when... <clears throat> Jesus is trying to, to explain some things to him. And Peter asks a question. Peter, Lord, how often or how many times can a brother sin against me and I still have to forgive him? As many as seven times? See, in the, in, at the time it was three times was okay. Three strikes you're out, right? Well, Peter said, well, let's do that times two plus one. So I'm going to double it and I'm going to give him seven times. And we'll add one to it. He asked that in earnest. Of course, Jesus says, 
Seven times that. Seventy times seven. Peter thought he was making the right thing. He was doing the right thing. He asked the question, how many times? And he gets his answer. Probably my most favorite one um, is when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. And he comes to Peter, and Peter says, no, you're not going to wash my feet. That's not going to happen. And he says, I have to. Jesus says, I have to wash your feet. Well, then Peter steps out on a limb and says, well, wash my whole body too. Wash everything. You're missing the point, Peter. It's not what it's about. But he's making that bold statement to ask for Jesus to do more. Chutzpah. There's plenty of other uh, things that we could talk about as well, but I, I want to talk about <clears throat> we're going to build Peter up and then we're going to build take him down and then we're going to end on a high note, okay? In John 6, Jesus has a very, very lengthy discussion with Sadducees, the Pharisees, the powers that be, and the Jewish faith. And he's trying to explain to them that he is the bread of life. Not as in the physical, we're going to eat it every day to sustain our lives physically. But that everything that he teaches, that everything that you need to know, about this world and about this life is going to come from him. And it was extremely difficult for these people to understand what he was saying. In <clears throat> verse 66 of that chapter, so many people had turned and left. It says, after this, many of his disciples, and disciples mean just his followers, the people throughout the, the region that were following him, not the apostles, but the disciples, they turn and they, they no longer work, uh, walk with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want me to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words to eternal life. And we have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Those people were following him because they wanted physical food. These 12 men followed him because they wanted spiritual food. Peter made that statement. Where should we go, guys? You're the only one. You are the one and only, the Holy One of God. You can sustain our spiritual life. In Matthew 14, the apostles again are on a boat. As far as I know, it's the second time that they're all together on a boat. Jesus has told them they're leaving a place and they should be going to the other side of the sea. Jesus is, at the time, he's praying up on the mountaintop by himself, trying to get away from uh, the crowds. And they're out there and they are floundering. They're a long way away from the sea. They've been tolling, they've been paddling, they've been rowing. They've been doing everything they can to get through to the other side. And it says that they're in the midst of the sea. They're being beaten by the waves, and the wind was against them. It's not fun being on a boat in strong winds. And I can't imagine it being fun on a boat when you're the only power that it has. It's in the middle of the night, about 3 a.m. They're scared. They're exhausted. They're afraid. The only comfort that they have is that that boat is still floating. And they see a ghost. Now, to us, that may seem a little odd, but in this same region is the same place that they saw Jesus send a, a, a demon legion into a, a, a herd or pack or whatever of swine and they go running off the cliff into the sea. Same place. 
Demons were alive. They were scared. They see one coming at them. Jesus says, Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter recognizes his voice. In John 10, in verse 3, <clears throat> Peter's talking about the good shepherd. And it says, To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow, for they know his voice. Verse 5, it says, A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Peter heard his voice, and he found comfort in his voice. He knew that Jesus could provide things that he needs. Jesus is walking on the water, something they had never seen. And he says, Lord, if it is you, we'll stop right there. The if is not a question. It's more of a statement of since it is you. Since it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Why would he want to go to the water? Because he found comfort in Jesus. He knew that he was a shepherd. Jesus said, come. If it was a demon, would he have taken that step? If it was a ghost, would he have taken a step? No. He knew it was Jesus. He had faith in Jesus. Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. Two men in history have walked on the water. Peter's one of them. We know the story doesn't end, but we're going to keep going. Also in Matthew, Matthew 16, Jesus has, has taught the disciples, and they're, they're moving to a region of Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asks this question, and he wants to know who people are saying that he is. Matthew 16 and verse 13. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter is the one that spoke up, the leader of the group. Simon Peter, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of John. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on, on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now what does this matter? Remember, he told him back in John 1 that his name would be Cephas. Here he tells him that his name would be Peter. Peter is a Greek term for Petros, which means stone. Cephas is an Aramaic term that's translated rock. Simon's a given name. Jesus is giving him a name to remember. You're no longer going to be Simon, but you're going to be Peter. You're going to be the rock that I, I found and established my church on. It is through you that that's going to happen. So many times when Peter 
was not doing what he was supposed to, Jesus addresses him as Simon. But when he's doing what he's supposed to, he addresses him as Peter. Not in every case, but it's a subtle reminder of who Jesus wanted him to be. Now, we built Peter up just a little bit. We're going to have to bring him down. In the book, um, 12 Ordinary Men, John MacArthur says this, Peter learned that crushing defeat and deep humiliation often fall hard on the heels of our greatest victories. I'll read that again. Peter learned that crushing defeat and deep humiliation often follow hard, follow hard on the heels of our greatest victories. In that same chapter that we just read, when Jesus says he's going to establish his church, with Jesus, I mean with, with Peter being the one to, to do that, he begins to tell them the, the many things that he's going to suffer. Verse 21, <clears throat> he's explaining that to them. He's going to suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This never shall happen to you. This never shall happen to you. And he turns to him and says, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on things of man. This is the same man that he's going to use to help establish his church. He didn't call him Simon. He called him Satan. Let's go back to walking on the water. Peter had the faith because he had comfort in Jesus. But he moved and changed his eyesight. He saw the wind and he was afraid. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus' response was, oh, you a little faith, why do you doubt? That word doubt is, <clears throat> is a word that means to, to, to have twice or two ways. He's come to a road, and he's got two ways that he can go. Or you think of it from a balance, and you've got weight, and it's so close that it wouldn't even balance itself out. And he chose the wrong way. He's caught on that balance, and he makes the bad decision because he took his eyes off of Jesus, and he begins to sink But Peter repents and says something simple. Lord, save me. Short and to the point, he recognized his fault. And that's, that's exactly what he needed at that exact moment in time. Jesus did not hesitate. I imagine they walked hand in hand back to the boat. When they got in the boat, everybody began to worship Jesus because they knew of who he was and what he could do. And they said, truly, you are the Son of God. Peter's lowest moment... <clears throat> I would say is either that in, in Matthew 16 when he's called Satan. But I think the thing that struck him the most is when Peter denies him three times and the rooster crows and he makes eye contact and he weeps bitterly. I'm not going to go into that story necessarily, but we all know the story and how bad that he had to feel that he did those things. But yet it was his chutzpah that said that it wouldn't happen. 
I'll go to the grave with you. There's no way I'll never I'll deny you. But he did. His faith failed. Why did Jesus let that happen? Why was it allowed to happen? Well, I think it's kind of going back to um, just a relationship that you would much rather your children fail while they're in your household when you can steer them in the right direction than when they're outside of your household and on their own. Jesus knew that he had an opportunity to steer Peter in the right direction. We don't know a whole lot about what Peter did from, from that moment until we see him again in John 21. But where is Peter found? On a boat. He's fishing. Probably something that he feels comfort in. Remember, just like Secretariat, he wasn't something that somebody else chose. Jesus chose him to follow him. And, and Peter felt, my race is done. It's over. I'll never live this down. But they find out that Peter, is, or Peter and them, they're close to, the, to the, the shore, and Jesus calls out to them. They catch their, their nets full of fish. Peter jumps out of the boat and runs to the shore. Because Jesus is cooking breakfast for them, it's not because he wants to feed them. It's because he wants to have a conversation with Peter. And Jesus asks a question three times, and each time he calls him Simon. Simon, do you love me? Simon, do you love me? Simon, do you love me? And that third time, it got him. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter was restored that day. And on the day, <clears throat> on the day of Pentecost, he delivers a message that changed the lives of 3,000 people. In, a, in another instance, he changed the lives of 5,000 people. Two different times. He changed the souls of 8,000 people. And two times he was able to do that, excuse me. 8,000 people. That's over twice the city of Moulton. He established the church through speaking through Jesus. In Acts 5 and verse 14, it says this of Peter. And it's not to say that they were healed, but that they wanted to see him so much. It says this in 514, And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on, the co on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. They just wanted for his shadow to pass by them. Peter stood in front of the Sanhedrin and talked about this after he healed a, a, a lame man. And they're telling him all these things that he shouldn't do. And Peter says, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. He stood right there in front of the most powerful people in the Jewish nation and told them exactly what he was going to do. After already being thrown in prison. And gets thrown in prison again. Again. 
Peter wrote two letters. Two very wonderful letters. And if you haven't read through them, chapters 1 through 5 and 1 through 3, I would suggest you do it. It's very, <clears throat> very interesting just to read through all that because he's trying to encourage people. So Peter, in all his confidence, may not have had just a whole lot of patience. But he penned this in the second epistle, chapter 3 and verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that the Lord, I'm sorry, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. See, in that chapter and in that epistle, he's talking about all the bad things and all the bad things that people had done throughout the year. But yet, in all those bad things in Sodom and Gomorrah, he still sought out Lot and saved him. And even though we wait and we wait for Jesus to come, he's telling us that he will still have patience that we would not perish, but that we would repent. He gave Peter that opportunity. He restored him, and like I said, he changed at least 8,000 souls, and we know of more. Christ did so many things for us, and he died for us. He's willing to give us opportunities. For those of you who have not been baptized and would like to do that this morning, we have a, a baptistry prepared for you. We'd be happy to do that. <clears throat> if you are struggling, maybe you've said some things or done some things that you're not proud of, and you'd like to lay those before the congregation for us to pray over, we'd be happy to, uh, to do that this morning. And come and do that as we stand and as we sing.